This episode, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the patios, a new apartment complex we just put under contract where I meet up with Kyle Deacon so he can show us exactly what to look out for when inspecting a multifamily property during the due diligence period. Now, Kyle has been in business doing property management since 2001. He's got a team of 16 employees and currently manages around 1,000 units in the Albuquerque, New Mexico area. There are some major pitfalls he's gonna help some of you avoid, so let's get into it. Welcome to Seeking Unemployment, a show dedicated to the most efficient path to financial freedom. You ready to do this, Kyle? I'm ready. All, All right. right. Let's do it. All right. All right, so um, what do we got here on the exterior of the building? What exterior items should we be looking for? So just starting from the street end, we're looking at, you know, parking area. It's relatively well maintained, which is really important because asphalt work is very expensive. Okay. Um, we're noticing here that we have sewer cleanouts, which is important is it, because that's what this is that's right, here? This is right okay. here, which is really important because it means that if we do have a main line backup, we're going to have a much easier time running a snake, having a much clearer access to the main line. If they weren't here, we would be relegated to being up on the roof trying to run a snake through a much smaller vent to reach the main line. Sure. And so this also gives us an indication when we're looking at older properties that we do have a sewer line that is, is likely in better shape than if we were looking at a property maybe 30 or 40 years older okay. before they actually installed cleanouts for properties by code. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And so then equally... I would have it, never thought of that. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's one of those things you kind of get used to really looking for when you learn the hard way, you know, <laughs> and fun, come, you know, spend some time trying to get a a main line unclogged from a very challenging roof vent but yeah. equally you know looking at the roof roofs are always really important and in this case that includes our mechanical systems this property has swamp coolers and if we take a little step back we can see you know we're noticing some rust on these guys okay. and so that gives yeah. us a pretty good indication that you know we're getting towards the end of the serviceable life of some of these coolers um, you know with maintenance you know you can push a swamp cooler 15 years maybe but generally you're looking at a lifespan of about 10 years and so um, you know that's an important consideration as you're purchasing because as you you know you start to add up this particular property has 44 apartments so that's 44 swamp coolers and so if we're looking at a lot of deferred maintenance on coolers that becomes a pretty big price tag okay. obviously yeah, absolutely. And then similarly, because we're in New Mexico, we, we do have a plethora of flat roof construction. So that's obviously a concern. And with, you know, our, our mile high city and extreme heat going down to very cold temperatures at night, we have a lot of expansion and contraction that occurs during the day and nighttime, which means that roofs need to be really well maintained, especially flat roofs, because they will start to open up around our penetrations, our roof vents, our, our swamp cooler jacks and that sort of thing. And that's where water penetrates and leaks occur. So, you know, look Looking at a, a, a maintained roof, even if it's a little older, also gives a good feeling and indication of how the property is being maintained in general. Very good. So. Cool. A little bit of a litmus test for the entire thing. Yeah. Like a lot of times people will avoid, you know, even getting on the roof when they come to do a normal walk around or an inspection. Roofs will go largely ignored. And if, if they're given attention and we get on the roof and see that, it gives me a better comfort that maybe the things I'm not seeing in every apartment as I walk into them, you know, I'm, I'm not having to worry too much about things that might have been hidden, corners that might have been cut by previous workmen, previous managers, and that sort of thing. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Um, let's walk uh, down this way then. Okay, great. And um, so here we're, what are we doing? We're looking at some of these units as we walk down this. And this is a unique property because it's called the patios. Hence exactly. All of the patios um, on either side before you get into the building. Exactly. And New Mexico being a, a very nice, you know, beautiful climate, we have 350 days a year of, of weather that will allow us to be outside. And so it's absolutely essential and a huge amenity for any apartment living situation to have outdoor space. When I'm helping people purchase apartments uh, in you know, other areas of town where there's, there's more limited backyard options, I'm often trying to figure out how to get them in there so I can add some value to the apartment by adding that really essential amenity. The fact that we already have these beautiful, big outdoor living areas that are also very private, as you see, yeah. is a huge bonus. Equally, the fact that they're, it's another layer of security and, and another sound buffer as well is also really important when you're looking at living and sharing walls with other people. And so this gives it more of a feeling of a casita. It makes it feel a little more detached than if we look around at some of the stacked apartments that are around us as well. Cool. Yeah. That's great. So can we take a look inside one of the units? Oh, absolutely. Cool. Yeah.
but let's talk a little bit about just the kitchen here. Um, yeah. I'm sure with all the electrical, stoves, gas, uh, you know, pipes, all of that, um, gray water, there's going to be lots of things going on here so to, to look out for. Exactly. What, and do we, what do we want to be careful of here in the kitchen? So, you know, we want to pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the sink area for sure. I think I always like to come in and just have a quick look under the sink. I always try to get in and, and feel for the angle stops, see about seeing if I can actually turn them, turn them off. And so in this case, the angle stops are, are, are flexible and loose, which is great. It gives us the opportunity to know that if we have a problem with the faucet, we're not also changing out the entire plumbing down here. It's also nice to see uh, in this particular unit that we actually have, you know, it's an older P-trap, but it's the right type of plumbing. Um, and a lot of units we go into, we'll see the handyman version where we can tell right away that a licensed plumber has not done the work because mm -hmm. they'll use some kind of an accordionized configuration oh, that's, that's just t twisted and turned all it around. Catches lots of bacteria. Exactly. And again, gives an indication of, you know, potentially corners being cut and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then obviously we're with the gas we're, we're making sure we're not smelling gas leaks and and just kind of checking around to you know behind appliances looking at the condition of things this is an older apartment so on the other end of it i'm looking at okay what are we going to do to make this modernized to help bring the rents up and and that sort of thing so they've started with a great you know vinyl plank floor here yeah. what i'd love to see is all the way through the entire apartment much sleeker at this point, if I advertise for a rental and I put no carpet with an exclamation point, that's about as big of an amenity as anything. It almost doesn't matter what the flooring is, but vinyl plank is for sure the preferred, preferred flooring yeah. because everyone knows it can take such a beating. Yeah. Tenants love it because it's sleek and easy. It's not nearly as cold as tile, so it works in a bedroom. For me, it's great because it can just go throughout the entire unit. I don't have to have multiple types of flooring. And on the other end of it, it's so resilient. If this sink you know, had a major problem and we had a serious flood issue while a tenant was gone, one of those water lines burst and flooded the whole apartment, this floor can be submerged and it's going to be fine. Whereas once that carpet gets wet, it's done for. That's it. We're, we're tearing it out instantly. Yeah. And, and while it's wet, most likely to try to prevent further damage of it wicking up walls and that sort of thing. So looking at trying to kind of update the kitchen, we have some broken tiles and some pretty dated uh, tile work as well. Sometimes dated is cool and it can be vintage. This is not that obviously. <laughs> so we would want to look at potentially redoing the counter. And I do like that sink though. It's pretty, pretty neat. So yeah. ideally there'd be a way to salvage it. Yeah. And, and that's the other piece of it. You're looking at where do I spend money to get the best return and where do I stop? Because as you do get into an older apartment like this, you could easily walk in here and, and overspend. And so a lot of this is looking at, you know, where are the areas that I can that I can actually, you know, spend some money to get a good return on my investment, raise the rents the way that I need to without overdoing it and overdoing it vis-a-vis -vis the area or, you know, just putting too much into it for, for, you know, getting a much smaller return and not being able to get the rents that you're looking for. Yeah, great. Cool, I'm, I'm seeing here, uh, you know, some bars here. Is this considered an upgrade since it's more of a security thing? You know, I wouldn't think of that so much as an upgrade. No, I would prefer to have that removed actually, mm -hmm. let the window be, and then instead of having that particular type of door, I'd put a security door on instead. Oh, okay. And so the other thing to think about here with this property is with utilities included, one of the first things I notice is the most uh, or the least energy efficient possible type of single pane aluminum frame windows. And so one of my first uh, recommendations would be obviously take those out, put in a nice thermal window. And since we're paying the utilities here, you know, our whole goal is to get those expenses down. Absolutely. We would see that come right back to us. And that, that would be a great thing to do. Not to mention it makes tenants feel a whole lot better to see a nice thicker window. Yeah. They'll be very appreciative of it and they'll operate much better. I can assure you if we go through and open, try to open all these windows, we're gonna find locks don't work correctly. The windows don't slide right. They're wobble jankered. You know, a lot of the internal hardware is probably not, not right. So yeah, they're beyond their serviceable lives. I would think that a tenant would also be pretty happy about the sound issues as well. I exactly. Know thicker, you know, multi-pane glass is 
really really great with sound um, sound dampening. Yeah, and, and in this or case, privacy. yeah, and in this case too, it's nice to see you know the block construction is is, is going to be a, a helpful element of that as well. I think in terms of just being a good noise buffer, and there's potential here. It's all been painted over, but I think you do have some opportunity to do some unique design choices and that sort of thing, albeit within a budget. You know, because you, one thing you don't want to be doing is touching up a whole bunch of different kinds of crazy paint as you do a turnover. Yeah. as well you kind of try to think of into the future in that way as well so i'm seeing this right here this seems like a real easy fix looks like maybe a bondo or something on that and that yeah. would be something you probably just paint over and be good with exactly yep and this door's you know it's been through quite a bit but i think with a bit more repair and and some some shifting and a good coat of paint it'll actually be just fine cool. changing out the hardware ideally to something a little more modern as well let's take a step outdoors here um let's see all right, so here we are, we're outside. This is kind of like a back little patio area as well. Um, this is one of the only ones that I've seen in this complex that's covered. Right. It's kind of cool. Yeah. And it looks like it has its own garage access as well. Yep, way. yep. Um, but here we have a wall that's missing. Um, and uh, so interestingly enough, I found out about what happened to this wall because I was talking to one of the neighbors that lives here and he gave me a whole backstory on the entire thing. It was kind of an amazing story. Um, I uh, do you do you ever recommend investors doing that? You know, talking to tenants and seeing how they like living in the place. Oh, absolutely, that? That absolutely. Valuable? Yes, and I would say um, a couple of things about that. You can never have too much information. There's never a time people will over communicate where you go, oh, I wish they hadn't told me all of that. <laughs> tenants are really happy to share information. The key is, in fact, they're kind of dying to a lot of the time. The key is, as you're doing these types of walkthroughs, is to just prepare yourself that, you know, the landlord's an easy person to dislike, an easy, an, e an easy person to, to make the bad guy, and a lot of times that's often our role, unfortunately, as well. So you have to take a lot of what they're saying as you're looking at buying a property and what they say about the existing management company, the existing owner, all the things they're not doing. Just take it with a grain of salt, because yeah. I've, I've actually never done a walkthrough where I've not had that happen, where I've not had a tenant pull me aside and go, I can't wait till you guys take over because this guy's a crook and this guy doesn't do his job correctly and what oh have you. It's just, just kind of part of the, the really nature funny. of the business. That's really funny. That's great. Um, and uh, what other things are you able to find out um, through, I mean, do you, do you ever look at financials? I mean, I heard of a story where there was a guy, um, so he was walking a property and they, they walked into one of the units and this it was a vacant unit but the sink was running mm -hmm. it was just going right. full blast just going not overflowing but just running right and they noticed on the bill that there was um there was a huge water bill for this like a high complex. consumption notice yeah yeah and it was all because of this one thing um do you ever use so, I mean, do you ever get access to those kinds of bills and things like that that come come through the property and give you red flags on what might be going on? Absolutely, and that's at, you know it's an essential part of your due diligence process uh, to identify and be able to compare it and make sure that it makes sense in terms of the usage because you obviously you don't want to get into a property that has unusually high usage that's unexplainable. It's actually a relief sometimes to find oh that's why the water bill is so high. You know, as a property manager, obviously, whether we pay the water bill or not, depending on the type of situation that we're dealing with, like if it were a single family home, for example, the tenant would pay the bill, but we would still receive a copy. We receive a copy of every water bill in our office. And a lot of that beyond the payment part of it is to monitor it, to see, okay, wait a minute, could we potentially have a leak here? Yeah. And so if you see that high consumption, then that's when you get a notice out to the building where the water meter is located and you start by, you know, trying to gain information from the tenants asking them if they're having a, a running toilet, for example, dripping sink, dripping shower valve. If they say no, then that's when you go in, you make sure all the units are shut off, and the first step is you go out to the water meter and you pull it. If everything is off and we verify that and the meter's still spinning, that's when we know we're into the potential of you know a, an underground leak or something mm -hmm. like that. that Much better to find it though through the bill and that process than to have it be the Sunday evening call where there's suddenly a geyser in the parking lot. You know, I'd much prefer yeah. the first for sure. I would even be more afraid of the one you have no idea where it is. It's just underground somewhere <laughs> and you got to start digging. Yeah. And we, an archaeologist. Exactly. And there are leak detection companies out there and we certainly had to use them. But on the other hand, it's not a perfect science. No question. I've seen them 
pinpoint and guess and not get it right as well. And so that's unfortunately part of the nature of property management. Sometimes it's not as easy to solve as you'd hope. Um, but on the other end of it, you know, everything after enough gumption, you know, you'll find a resolution in one way or another. Sure. Yeah. Very cool. Um, great. Is, are there any other things that um, that you could really help another investor that's really trying to find, you know, what problems might there be in my, you know, maybe they're buying a quadplex or something like that. Um, what, what do they need to look for? Uh, anything else we haven't touched on? Yeah, I mean, just coming from the outside in, if you show up to a really beautiful apartment complex, and you know, we started on that side where the grass was, and that's a really nice little spot of grass, and they're doing a good job maintaining it. But if we found that you know, the entire complex is covered in grass and there's massive irrigation, that might be the first place to start and reconsider, okay, I wonder if I could do more of a xeric landscape, take some of that grass out, eliminate the potential for major problems with sprinklers, because that is an area where you're gonna have higher bills, a lot more maintenance problems. If a sprinkler's kicked, for example, becomes a geyser, you feel it on your water bill until it's reported, and then of course you have the expense of the repair. But if you have a much lower maintenance landscape and you're able to make that conversion, here in Albuquerque, if you do that, you actually get some you know, benefits from the city in terms of credits back towards your water bill um, for, for saving water. And so that, you know, energy efficient modes like that are, are important things to consider as well. Going back to the windows, there are some energy saver programs that will, you know, a allow our utility companies to help contribute potentially, you know, to adding those new thermal windows or changing out and put in more efficient heating systems. And again, it all gets measured about, you know, making sure that you're providing a great living space and also getting a good return for your investment. We couldn't necessarily come in here and put, you know, a force central heating brand new refrigerated air system in each one of these units and justify the expense. What they have here is great. Just putting the windows in will help retain that heat a lot better will make for happier tenants and a happier landlord is paying less every month on their utility bill okay, yeah. yeah similar Absolutely. with the landscape as well yeah the only other thing I can think of that we may not have touched on is electrical yeah um, what, what electrical red flags can you, can you come across in the units themselves you know in an older property we expect that we're not going to find GFIs in the kitchens and the bathrooms and I think it's important to think about safety in that mode kind of what it's going to take to get them installed what's the most cost-effective way to do it I always go to the breaker panel and I look for some of the red flags that I've just found through osmosis with all the property inspections I've done. In this instance, we have uh, panels that are actually uh, Federal Pacific panel, which is known to be a safety hazard. And so it's an important consideration yeah. to uh, consider you know, making that uh, part of your objection process to call it out as a potential safety hazard. Another one that we see a lot of in Albuquerque and older properties is the Zinsco electric panel as well. Mm -hmm. And both have, uh, are, are you know, no longer in operation and, and they've been completely discontinued for safety reasons because they can catch on fire, mm. basically. That's a pretty good reason. Yeah, <laughs> and so I've actually never actually heard of it happening in Albuquerque where a Federal Pacific panel caught on fire, but obviously it's happened elsewhere. And, you know, um, any, any investor needs to understand that to replace a breaker in a panel like this that's been discontinued is gonna cost a whole lot more than it would if it were like a square D panel or something like that. And so they can still find like a, a knockoff brand that will make a, a breaker that can go into this panel at Home Depot, but it'll be astronomically more expensive to okay. do that. So to maintain is gonna be harder and then equally, you now have the burden of knowing that there's a potential safety issue here. And so sure. it needs to be called out and flagged in turn. Okay, very cool, that's great. All right, so uh, yeah, you already mentioned uh, some landscaping issues. Is there anything else on the landscaping front? On the landscaping front? Um, that you could run into as a red flag. I, I, I don't know, are things like a, like gopher holes or anything like that a concern? That, that's probably pretty minor, I would think. I mean, you're, of course, you're looking at potential safety issues and the potential for being sued. So if I'm walking down a walkway and I'm seeing elevated you know, pieces of sidewalk because I've got yeah. tree roots, and obviously I need to be worried about that a little bit. I, I have unfortunately um, had a couple of lawsuits in my time as a property manager for slip and falls um, where folks tripped over a sidewalk and the next thing I knew I had an attorney calling me in an insurance claim in process. That sounds awesome. And so yeah, it's important to, to keep an eye on that sort of thing. And then, you know, equally, um, you know, related to just general exterior, I, you're, you're really wanting to make sure that you're going to be able to have the most cost-effective landscape plan because when you're looking at an APOD and you're going to turn around to sell the property, landscaping, you know, you, you really don't want to have a tremendous expense there. So again, looking at the most um, easiest maintenance, lowest maintenance type of landscape, if we have a really massive, gorgeous landscape, it might really add tremendous curb appeal, but it means that I have to have a company come in every two weeks, which means that that's that much more money. 
property like this that's a lot of xeric, a lot of um, you know more kind of hardscape. We are going to have to be concerned about weeds, especially in spring right now with monsoon season coming right after that, a lot of moisture. But you know, otherwise, you know, ideally, we'll be able to keep that landscape bill down significantly. And so as I'm measuring what the existing ownership has provided for expenses and looking at ways that we can lower those as we're you know, taking over the property and trying to figure out a, a new strategy. That's great. Very cool. Um, well, I think we got a lot of great content there. I, I, I can't think of anything else to touch on. but. Um, but I get, you know, actually one last question for you. Um, do you recommend people go through every single unit or just a couple when they're doing their due diligence on a, on a complex? I recommend going through every single unit. And I think a really good and cost effective way to do that, especially if you're a more sophisticated investor and you feel really confident in, you know, your sense of how things work and what right looks like go in and have a termite inspection done and I'd actually recommend having a full pest inspection so that you're getting bed bugs identified, German cockroaches, ants and you know it's, it's a very inexpensive type of inspection it's a very rapid type of inspection but it also gets you access to every single unit and so you're kind of riding their coattails and I love just going in to every single one of them because the second piece of that is getting a sense of your tenant population and so if you're doing this inspection most of the time it's during the daytime it helps you as an investor know, okay, here's what I'm looking at as I try to transition this property. If I go through a full apartment complex and every unit's empty on a Tuesday afternoon, then honestly I feel pretty good about my existing tenant um, mix because I, I'm realizing I've got a, a group of, of working professional people, students sure. who are out and they're busy. If I go through a place where it's the middle of the day and 90% of my occupants are at home watching TV, that's a higher level of concern because it will likely be a flag for a lot more homebodies, which probably means more personality management, more concerns for, for kind of lower priority maintenance needs sure. and that sort of thing as well. And it helps you get a sense of, okay, as we start to transition and upgrade units, what are we going to be looking at in terms of how we retain our tenants and, and that type of thing as well. Yeah. That's a really good tip. I like that idea of using the using the, the pest, uh, what do you call it, uh, basically like a uh, pest? Uh, yeah, pest inspection. It's pest really, inspection, it starts yeah. with termites and dry rot. And then I like to expand it to include, you know, the other pests that we, you know, unfortunately run into and we're totally afraid of as property managers, but we all bump into them as bed bugs or German cockroaches. And so it's important to identify those because a normal, a normal termite inspection will only look at, at wood basically and, and wood destroying organisms. But, you know, the, the bigger pest will, will pinpoint signs of cockroaches and that sort of thing, which again goes back to, did they have a good pest maintenance program when they were running the property themselves? And am I getting into something where I'm going to have major pest problems? Because that's obviously a major tenant issue as well. You can remodel a beautiful apartment and then move someone in and there's a bunch of cockroaches. They are not going to feel good about that. No. Yeah. I used to live in Hawaii and even the big, really, really big mansions all have cockroaches too. Yeah, so and, and that's similar in New Mexico. I tell everyone, it doesn't matter where you live, you're going to see them. Yeah. The key is hopefully if you have a good pest maintenance program, you're going to see them dead. You know, and <laughs> you pick up the dead ones and that's it and you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not a big infestation of a whole colony. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Well, those are really great tips. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Oh, my pleasure. Appreciate Thank you, Shane. All right, we hope you learned something from that walkthrough with Kyle Deacon. If you wanna get in touch with him for your own property management needs, the link will be in the description below. And click right up here for part two of the property walkthrough um, where we get in touch with Tate Seamer. We bring him on camera and he'll talk to us a little bit about putting the deal under contract and what he looks for when he's doing his due diligence on a brand new property. So let's take a look.